Opportunity here to uh, introduce Professor Professor John Shaw. Um, he's going to be. He also happens to have the longest title I think I've <laughs> seen in any seminar. So you get some kind of award for that. Um, but um, so for those of you that don't know Professor Shaw, who actually is now a research professor, can be let go at any time. I suppose if you run out of money. I only hope if you run out of money. So you got one foot out the door already. But um, so John has done a lot of work for a lot of years uh, for Landsat as it relates to LBCM. Uh, but um, I'll just give you some of the highlights here. I've got his, give me a whole sheet here, but I'm not going to read this whole thing. Uh, but uh, so many moons ago, I won't put dates on it, but um, John got his bachelor's degree in physics at Canisius College. And then he went on to um, SUNY uh, ESF, that's uh, Syracuse, and their uh, environmental science and uh, remote sensing program there. He got his PhD, again, a bunch of years ago. Uh, then he worked at uh, CalSpan, I think that's out in Buffalo, right? Yeah, for a number of years. And then he showed up here at RIT in, uh, in 1980. So that's kind of the starting point. Everything's before that. Um, and uh, he worked or is still working, I guess, for a little while longer, uh, here for 36 years. So that's a fair amount of time, okay? And then uh, four years later, after he got here in 84, he started or founded the Digital Imaging and Remote Sensing Group, or DEERS. So for those of you newbies that don't know the origin of DEERS, we've gone through a few directors. Um, John is the origin of DEERS. And uh, he served that role for about 25 years until we moved on and we got another director and, and uh, we are what we are today. Uh, since then, John is sort of retired. He's got one foot out the door. He gave up his tenure status, and he's a research faculty. But he still touches. I know this is my presentation, so I'm going to be done here in five seconds. Um, but he still uh, is active. He comes in, you know, a few times a month, meets with his students. But uh, this may be one of his last big talks. But, uh, let's see. There's some other rigmarole in here that deals with uh, being on the advisory board for uh, the Intelligence Science Board, and that uh, consults with the DNI, Director of um, National Intelligence, and so on and so forth. Uh, he's got a mere, just a couple hundred publications and uh, a couple books. Okay. Uh, and with all that hype, uh, let me hand it over to Professor Schott. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I brought my mug. <laughs> it travels with me everywhere. Emmett and I did not collude on this, but it turns out that I'm going to talk to you about Landsat. You've already the title. Uh, today, <coughs> afternoon in a couple of hours, there's a big party down at Washington. I'm here giving you a boring talk instead of being at the party where I should be. Uh, but I'm leaving for Europe in a couple days. My wife said I could go to Washington today. So we didn't plan this, but by serendipity, there's a celebration in Washington at uh, the USGS uh, celebrating the birth of the concept of Landsat. So for those of you who uh, don't know some of these names, I'll give you a little background. Uh, William Pecora, Bill Pecora, was the head of the uh, U.S. Geologic Survey in the mid-60s and a big champion of remote sensing and earth observation. 
and he convinced the director of the Department of the Interior, Stuart Udall, one of the most preeminent environmentalists of any era, but in particular that era, that looking at the Earth from space would be great for studying the Earth's resources, and in particular the resources that the Department of the Interior was responsible for, the forests and the lands of the United States. And Stu Udall said publicly 50 years ago today, we're going to do this. He didn't have a budget, didn't have authorization from Congress. He just said to the public, we're going to do this. And there was a big brouhaha behind the scenes because the Defense Department, the intelligence agencies, Central Intelligence in particular, and NASA felt they owned space. And what the hell was the Department of the Interior all going in to the space business? And so very quickly, uh, NASA took over and said, we're going to build the satellites for the Department of the Interior and call them Earth's Earth Resources Technology Satellites. And they did, and very shortly after launch, they were renamed Landsat. So I'm going to talk about Landsat, but it started out as Eros, the Earth Resources Observation Satellite, under Udall's nomenclature when he started. By the way, you should be familiar with that name because Eros, the Earth Resources Observation System, is what the USGS Center out in Sioux Falls is where all the Landsat data is stored. So they revived the name in, in recognition of, uh, of Stu Udall. If you don't know that name, look up, spend a little time on the web. He was quite a character, quite an environmentalist, and we owe him a lot of thanks for uh, the state of the uh, environment in the U.S. today. Thoughts about Landsat? So let me give you, I'm trying to cover 35 years in 45 minutes, so it's a minute and a half a year. i got to talk quickly here. But please ask questions, because I'd rather not finish my talk and talk to you than raise all these slides. Well, I can tell you quickly about Landsat. Uh, the first one was launched, so Udall announced this in 66. By 72, six years later, we had the uh, first Landsat go up. There was a string of them, Landsat two, 1, 2, 3, were four bands, green, red, two near infrared bands, 80 meter resolution on the ground, whisk room sensors, that means they took data by sweeping up pixels like this with a spinning mirror uh, across the Earth's surface. Landsat 4 and 5, 4 launched in 82, 5 and 84 were the next generation. They're the modern era. That's where I'm going to spend most of my talk. Uh, they had seven spectral bands from the moon through the long wave infrared, thermal. We're going to talk a lot about thermal. Uh, and they had roughly 30 meter resolution, except for the thermal bands, were, which were of order 100 meters. And then we had a oops. <laughs> 15 years. I'll come back to that story. And in 1999, we watched, launched Landsat 7, which is essentially the same as uh, 4 and 5. It had a, a panchromatic band with a 15 meter resolution, and the thermal band was sharpened a little bit. But essentially, 4, 5, and 7 are very similar instruments, all whisk rooms. Then 14 years, another, oh my God, what's happening with the government? Uh, and in 2013, we launched Landsat 8. It's a dramatically different technology. It's a push broom scanner, long linear array sweeping across the Earth that allowed us to improve the signal to noise dramatically. We also added a couple more uh, spectral bands. And uh, as long as I'm on this signal to noise or offshoot, this is a 10 bit instrument, lots of radiometric range. You can see very fine changes in the brightness of the Earth. Back here we were at 7 bits, and 4, 5, and 7 were 8 bits. That's as much as I can tell you about Landsat. They're great instruments. They circle the globe. They image the Earth. Uh, about 16-day repeat intervals, 16, 18, depending on which instrument. Uh, if you look at the overlap here after one the first year or two, there have been two Landsats in space almost all the time, which means they image the Earth about every 8 or 9 days and have for most of the life of Landsat. That becomes important when you start doing temporal studies and also when you want to see past the clouds. In Rochester, it's tough to get one clear scene a day, even with two sensors up there taking a picture every eight or nine days. So this is Landsat. Uh, 
down into the little SI here between uh, Landsat 7 and LDCM, which was the nomenclature before they changed it to Landsat 8, uh, in this long period in here, uh, NASA was exploring some new technology actually back in here leading up to Landsat uh, 7. They were exploring some new technology uh, in a program called EO-1, a satellite called EO-1. And that satellite had what was called ALI. It was a push boom tech demo, so it wasn't an operational satellite. It didn't have a lot of coverage, but it demonstrated the technology that led to Landsat 8. More important for us, it flew a uh, Hyperion instrument, which was an imaging spectrometer, one of the first imaging spectrometers in space. It had a very narrow field of view, so it didn't have much global coverage, but it was designed to demonstrate what could be done. Well, leading up to that, NASA ran a program called EOCAP Hyperspectral. Uh, RIT had a subcontract to Eastman Kodak to look at what you could do with hyperspectral data leading up to the demonstration program in EO-1 and eventually to what we hope will be hyperspectral sensors in space later on. I just mentioned that in this overview because I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about uh, Hyperion. So we got this Landsat history, so there's all the Landsat spread out for you from 72 to the present. How does RIT come into play? Well, we won our first program in uh, 1981 to work on the Landsat program. But to get into that and explain that, why that's important, let me back up a second and tell you where RIT was in 1980, 81. We did almost no research anywhere at the university and we did no remote sensing. I joined the faculty here in 1980, and within months, we were awarded one of the major research efforts that NASA awarded in that period to be a scientist investigating what you could do with the next generation of plants. That next generation at this point is these new uh, <coughs> instruments that were launched, uh, to be launched in 1982. So I'm going to start my story by backing up, saying, how the hell did this happen? And uh, it's a, uh, I think to this day, uh, a goof. The uh, reviewers who were uh, looking at proposals in the 70s for a program called Hickam uh, didn't look at my resume. I was two years out of college, not even in graduate school. So I had a baccalaureate degree. I was working at this company I haven't mentioned so called Cornell Aeronautical Laboratories. And I wrote a proposal to work on the, the HCMM experiment and was awarded the, uh, the program. I still remember walking up to give my first talk. I think it was the first time I was at a NASA facility, uh, the second at best. And here I am, a 23-year-old kid, uh, just awarded a, a principal investigator program on Hickam. And I think some, most of the people there thought I was the uh, uh, surrogate for some faculty member who couldn't come and was their graduate student, uh, not PI. And, and as uh, my friend John Price walked off the stage, he became the, uh, the chief scientist on the HCM of the Hickam program. Uh, he's walking down the stairs, I'm walking up the stairs, and he leans over and he says, good luck, kid. Uh, that was the start of my work here, Why did, how could I win that to begin with? When I came to CalSpan, they gave me a Vietnam era thermal infrared line scanner, surplus scanner, and said, you know, give it to the kid, see if he can figure out what to do with it. So I had flown this airborne camera, I, I figured out a couple of things we could do with it, and so I wrote in the proposal that we'd underfly Hickam with this thermal infrared camera and study a number of things, and what I'm going to show you here is uh, the thermal bar that forms in the Great Lakes. So this is a bright as hot <coughs> image. You see this warm water, this warm ring around Lake Ontario, and these little boxes are flight lines. And one of the things that people knew the thermal bar existed, but had never really imaged it carefully from space. And one of the things I wanted to do is see if one could we image it, see the, the extent. People had seen it by cutting across it in a boat and measuring the temperature. So having a big look at the thermal bar of the whole lake was the new concept. And more importantly, we had speculated that the thermal bar and water quality were co closely correlated. And what we showed in this early study is this is one of a picture, a 
photographs because that's what we used for data in those days was photographs. <laughs> this is a photograph where this is the inshore, this is the very clear deep lake water, and this occurs right at that thermal bar. So we got turbid water inside, clear water outside, and we were able to begin to map the relationship between water quality and the thermal bar. So along comes the 1981, and NASA has a call for proposals for a program called LIDQA, Landsat Image Data Quality Assessment Program. It's what we would call a science team today, but they didn't use that terminology then. I had joined RIT in 80, and within a few months, in 1981, we were awarded this program to work on the LIDQA team. So basically what happened was somebody screwed up while I was at CalSpan and gave me that first award, Kelvin was a big remote sensing place. I was able to take advantage of the fact that uh, I had that experience from CalSpan and drag the CalSpan reputation with me here to RIT and was able to win this award even though RIT didn't have any track record of remote sensing. They took a, a, a good look at us. Our CalSpan let me bring my thermal scanner, that little toy that I was playing with, uh, with me when I came here. So we were going to fly that and leave. You know, I had a, a story to tell about the thermal bar. So one of our tasks under the LIDQA program was to study the thermal bar. That's a thermal image from Landsat, much higher resolution than Hickam. But what we wanted to do was say, could we look at the water quality with Landsat as well, as well at least the turbidity. HCMM didn't have visible bands. Landsat's got visible bands. This is a true color stretch, true color image. And now you can see the water quality variation roughly corresponding to some of what's going on with the thermal bar on the southern shore not so much correlation on the northern shore. And what we began to understand is that the water wasn't turbid because it was hot. The thermal bar controlled the flow of water, and where you've got water coming in from the Niagara River and from the Welland Canal, that turbidity is trapped inside the thermal bar and hugs the shore here. And so we began to understand some of these relationships, which we could only begin to see with these satellite systems. Also as part of the LIDQA program, we were asked to, because we had this airborne thermal instrument, see if we could check the calibration of the instrument. So what we did is we flew an airplane with a calibrated thermal instrument over the, uh, the water, we measured the temperature, the parent temperature up here, and we propagated that up to the satellite and said, this is the radiance the satellite should see. We compared to that to the radiance the satellite did see and could check was the instrument properly calibrated. And so this is an uh, image from an airborne system. This is actually not the the sensor we flew in the uh, early 80s. This is the instrument we built here at RIT later on and flew. This is a, a, thermalist, a thermal image of the Gene uh, power, the power plant, the hot water is brighter again. And we would look at places we measured on the aerial, places we measured on the satellite, compare them, check the calibration. And at the end of the, back when, at the end of the Lake era, we couldn't tell whether Landsat 4 was calibrated. They very quickly after the launch of 4 uh, had to shut down uh, and sto store it in space because the communications system failed. They launched Landsat 5 in a hurry. And so the program ended and we had been able to define that Landsat 5 was calibrated properly. Nominal is Landsat terminology or NASA terminology for uh, properly. And Landsat 4 we couldn't tell. It looked sort of funny. We didn't know anymore at this point. And at this point, the dark ages occurred. Uh, this was the 80s, the Reagan era. Uh, the government was trying to commercialize everything. And they said, well, we shouldn't be in this space imaging business for uh, Landsat type imagery. Uh, we should commercialize it. And so uh, the commercial people took over. The data became extremely expensive. So universities couldn't afford the data. In fact, most people couldn't afford the data. Uh, Landsat 6 uh, was a launch failure. It had nothing to do with the fact that it was a commercial venture, but there was a, one of these things that happened, and Landsat 6 went to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, there was a whole series of changes I don't have time to go into in the program management of the Landsat program. They kicked it back and forth between NOAA, the Department of Defense, all sorts of people. And so there was this period of a decade or more when uh, most of the community RIT included, turned away from Landsat because the data was too expensive. NASA was not managing the Landsat program. It was 
a commercial program, so they weren't funding investigators to, to do research like NASA did. And we spent most of our time in, in this period doing work for the intelligence community and all sorts of, of other things. So I, from the Landsat and NASA perspective, I think of it as the dark ages. We did a little bit of work for NASA in this period <coughs> that I want to come back to. Uh, the EOCAP program, the hyperspectral program that I mentioned there, NASA trying to figure out what do we do with, with hyperspectral data. This is an image, this is a spectrometer image, you can see the spectral dimension down here on the side. This was taken with our IT's uh, airborne spectrometer, an instrument we built here. Uh, this is a thermal image from the same instrument, you can see the power plant, you can see the temperature of water associated with that. What we did with this, on this program is we developed a technique to relate the spectra of water, the spectra from the model, we matched them, and from that you could begin to determine what was going on in the water. Uh, this is just an example of, this is a, a NASA spectrometer image, and color dissolved organic materials, is the yellow stuff in water, chlorophyll, and suspended solids, this is the particulate material. And this is a map of these little bays in here in Lake Ontario, and you can map the water quality. So we built this tool under this program. Uh, Rolando Arcanio did his PhD on this topic. Some of you may know Rolo. At the end of this dark period, there's a call for proposals for Landsat 7. We wrote a proposal and were selected to be on the Landsat 7 science team. By the way, each of these teams that I mentioned has maybe a dozen investigators that lead people from across the nation, hopefully. Sometimes not, like I said, they goofed with me when I was a kid. Uh, but the lead people from around the country get selected to be on these teams. Well, Landsat 7 comes along, we wrote a proposal after almost a dozen years of not doing much with NASA to look again at the uh, Great Lakes since they're right here. And what we said was, you know, if we had good thermal data, uh, we have these models of the hydrodynamics, what's going on with the water temperature and the water flow in the Great Lakes. Uh, but the problem is there's too many inputs. You need to put too much information into the models to ever get them to work right and match what's going on in the world. But what we said was if you take thermal imagery and you tweak the model to the thermal imagery that you're simulating in these models and the thermal data that you observe at the surface of the uh, water, the thermal data is only the very surface uh, match up, then you can watch how these things change over time. So this is the progression, the formation of the thermal bar here, thermal bar gets tighter and tighter and then it goes over and you've got hot water on the surface of uh, Lake Ontario. But you can also do this in three dimensions because this is a hydrodynamic model. It's got all of the, the four dimensions, 3D, spatially, plus time in the process. So this is what we did under the Landsat 7 uh, program, or one of the things we did. The other thing they asked us to do was we had this airborne thermal system and they said, well, when you check the calibration of Landsat 7, we've done it earlier on 4 and 5, they said, well, why don't you go back and redo the calibration of Landsat 7. So here's a set of data from roughly the first year of the, after launch of Landsat 7. It should be falling along, this is the radiance we say you should see in the satellite, this is the radiance the satellite observed. It should be along this one to one line, and it's not, it's shifted down. And this is data from a mixture of the airplane underneath the satellite, and also we had boats uh, and people out taking surface temperature measurements. We got better with the radiative propagation and could take this up to the satellite. And so we fixed this, basically. We had to adjust the satellite calibration. Uh, this got us on the Landsat Science, the Landsat Calibration Team, which we've done for uh, almost 20 years now. We worked with Landsat to check the calibration of the instruments, and this is uh, all the data for a decade or so, uh, it was calibrated after fixed and it worked well for quite some time. Well, we had a, a trick of uh, using, uh, we, we had a question of, we calibrated Landsat 5 in 1985, it was calibrated, within a half a degree, which is about our error at the time. In 1999, 2001, we had calibrated Landsat 5 again. They asked us to check on the calibration of Landsat 5. And it was slightly out of calibration, but not horrible. The question was, during that dark age, nobody had checked the calibration of the instruments. For almost 15 years, we had no idea what was going on 
with the calibration of Landsat 5 and thermal. And so we had developed and been playing with buoys. Noah's got these buoys that sit out in the oceans and in the lakes. And we had figured out a way to take the data from the buoys, propagate that up, there's thermal sensors, propagate that up to space, compare that with the satellite, and use the buoys in the calibration process. So we did that, one of our students did that, and what they found was Landsat 5 was calibrated, this is the error about zero here, Landsat 5 was calibrated to about 1998, and then something went funky, and it was miscalibrated, and we had to make an adjustment. And so we were able to work back in history such that all the Landsat thermal data now in the archive has been calibrated with RIT tricks. I mentioned Landsat 4 only worked for less than two years and then they took it offline. Well, it was offline for three years and then in 87 the TDRSS, the Tracking Data Relay Satellite System went up and they could reestablish communications and relink the imagery down. They communicated all along for housekeeping, but they couldn't get the images down. So after three years sitting basically in storage on orbit, they started it out back up and it ran for another six years. Again, how's the calibration working? We were unsure right after launch, we were still kind of unsure. But I had this hammer, I had these buoy tricks. And so we sacrificed another graduate student to take a look at Landsat 4. And what we found was, here's the zero here, the error was close to zero, it was reasonably calibrated, one funny point here, uh, but a lot of variability right after launch. Here's the dead time when it was stored in storage, and then it came back online and it's grossly miscalibrated, three degrees Kelvin, and so we could fix that, but also we did a little more exploring and found out that why was it screwed up? Well, they operated it at one temperature, you operate the satellite at one temperature here and a different temperature here, so we understood where this error came from. It was just because of the change in how they operated the satellite. Not to spend time on this, we use these buoys today to do essentially automated calibration. Most of the yellow dots there are buoys all over the North America. We use the, that data to calibrate the, uh, the new instruments. These are data from Landsat 8. You barely see these little blue dots here. They're minus 3. Minus four, this is right after launch, this is within just a few months after launch. If they got all these buoys, we can get the data quickly. And what we found was that it was totally screwed up. Uh, we didn't understand why. A team from NASA, USGS, RIT, uh, JPL tried to figure this out. And what we found out was that uh, here's a Landsat swathed on the face of the Earth. Here's a GOES image, much larger coverage. What we found out is that the energy hitting this line of data came mostly from the ground where it was supposed to, but some of it came from regions around where it was supposed to. It's a stray light issue. There's a screw up in the optics uh, when they built the instrument. Uh, here at RIT, we spent a bunch of time trying to fix this. Uh, Matt Monero and uh, Aaron Geraci have come up with a technique uh, which will calibrate all of the operational technique to calibrate and take this goof out of all of the data in the archive, dramatically improve the uh, calibration of the data. And Emmett and his student are working on a what they hope is an even better approach that would be used for very precise uh, calibration. We're good at thermal stuff. And so rather than just provide people with the radiance at the top of the atmosphere, we decided we should provide them with the temperature of the Earth's surface so working with our colleagues at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, RIT and JPL have come up with a technique to turn thermal images into surface temperatures. And this is a project that is uh, ongoing now. Uh, Monica Cook, a PhD student, and uh, Kelly Larrabee are generating this product. It will become a USGS product, and they will distribute <laughs> surface temperature maps based on RIT tools uh, in the near future. Landsat 8 science team becomes available. We proposed and won the opportunity to work on the Landsat 8 science team. Again, we're looking at the lakes. The difference now is we've got these hydrodynamic models that we can calibrate the flow data with the thermal. We said, well, we want to know what the turbidity is. What's the, if you've got a stream discharging into a waterway, how does that turbid water, the sediment in the water, the Genesee River jumping into Lake Ontario, how does that dissipate 
Well, again, there's too many inputs to the model for the hydrodynamic models to cover this. But if we calibrate the data with imagery from Landsat, we can, uh, we'll go into the details here, we can basically take the reflective data, which tells us about the turbidity, the sediments in the water, and force the model to give us the right answer. So now we can map the flow of sediments out into the water and subsurface below where you can see it. So our goal here with both the thermal and the reflective data is to be able to use the satellites to calibrate so that you can understand things you can't see with the satellite. The satellites only see the thermal, the very surface, and in the reflective, a few meters, and you want to know what's going on in the whole water body. We also, on Landsat 8, started to look at water quality. And we used the tricks that we had developed on EOCAP, which is why I did that hyperspectral analogy. We said we can use these hyperspectral tricks on multispectral data if we have enough bands. So there's enough bands, a handful of bands, uh, in the reflective region on Landsat 8 that let us use our model matching technique. So we've only got a few points here to match the shape of these curves, but a few points turns out to be enough. And you can use that to map chlorophyll, suspended solids and yellowing organics. You see down as the yellowing organics. And this is just a model of what you can do with various instruments. OLI is Landsat 8, and these are the errors you get from these various instruments. The magic here is that if you get these numbers under 10%, and all the sources of noise are included, you've got a chance to do good water resources studies, and we prove that with the uh, Landsat 8 instrument. Shifting gears, what other stuff? So a bunch of stuff. I'm doing two slides per project, many multi-year projects. We also did work for NASA to look at what would a new instrument, how would a new instrument behave? So we built, some of you have heard Deersig, Deersig talks, at least I hope you've heard Deersig talks, it's one of the center's uh, glowing successes. Deersig is a tool we use to simulate what instruments will see before they're built or understand how they're behaving after they're built. We built models of how Landsat would behave, Landsat 8 would behave before it was built. And Landsat 8 works in a funny fashion. If you look at, these are the focal plane arrays. They're offset from each other. There's 14 of them across the, uh, the field of view. And on the arrays, the detectors are offset. So this is what a Landsat 8 image would look like. You see the spectral bands offset from each other. That's because of the way the push boom instrument works. And the detectors are staggered from each other, so the shoreline, instead of being smooth, is all offset. These are simulations of what Landsat data would look like years before Landsat 8 flew that we generated made available to the, uh, the NASA community so that they could say, are my algorithms going to work? I try and stack things back up, put the images back together, the shift here is because this array is looking forward, this one's looking back. You get this trash of a data stream. And you can stack it all together, put everything back together, and get a good looking image out of it. We were simulating how you would do that. We also <coughs> on uh, the, uh, for Landsat 9, when it's in the concept stage now, they want to adjust some specifications on the instrument. They don't know how bad that's going to make the imagery look. We won't go into the details, but we're doing studies like that where we uh, adjust how the behavior of an instrument will be when they change the specifications. They're not going to get exactly the, the instrument they built the last time. What's the impact of that going to be? We're in a new era with Landsat. The Europeans have just launched uh, an instrument called Sentinel-2. They'll be launching Sentinel-2A. They launched, they're going to launch Sentinel-2B shortly. These are Landsat-class instruments. Behaviors and specs very similar to Landsat, but different. And the trick is, if we look at the Earth and we get data from Landsat-7, we get data from Landsat-8, we get data from Sentinel-2A, and data from Sentinel-2B, and I want to look at what's going on at the Earth, things wiggle and wobble because of the sensor, not because of what's happening on the Earth. And so what we're doing now is we're simulating what all of these instruments will do and how they will look at the Earth and how they will gather data so that we can begin to develop normalization techniques for taking all of that variability that's instrument-related, not Earth-related, out of the process. So these are just deer sick simulations of a forest with different levels of defoliation. So these are Foliation coming across here, LAI's leaf area index is how much uh, light gets through the, uh, the canopy. 
And these are bi-directional reflectance curves of these forests derived from deer signal. So I'm going to spend a few minutes and slow down and talk about the relationship between RIT and Landsat and Landsat and RIT. Note these are my myopic perspective. This is not RIT talking. Uh, it's not individual size talking. This is just stuff that I gathered from what all things we've done for Landsat. So what has RIT done for Landsat? Thermal calibration of the Landsat instruments is all done jointly by RIT and JPL. On the older uh, data, the JPL tricks don't work. The RIT tricks using the buoys, which were out there all this time, just taking data, stored in the NOAA archive. We went back and stole the data from NOAA and used it to calibrate the instruments. So all of the uh, calibration from 82 to 99 is, is done with RIT tricks. So anybody in the world who downloads a Landsat image has been calibrated in the thermal with RIT tricks. That's pretty much what that says. The land surface temperature product, LST's land surface temperature product, is something that RIT has developed. And again, you will shortly, when you order your Landsat data, which, by the way, is free now. You can get all the Landsat data you want for free. Uh, will come with a land surface temperature product largely based on tools that were developed here at RIT. Uh, I just talked about the design traits, many of the design traits for the Landsat 7, and Landsat 8 instrument, and ongoing now for Landsat 9 are being done using tools uh, that we work collaboratively with NASA. Basically, RIT has joined the Landsat teams that are developing these new instruments, and we're, we're part of, whenever they have a problem, whenever they're trying to make a decision, they come to us and say, can you tell us what would happen in terms of appearance of the image, the quality of the image, or the specifications on the image. If we make this change in engineering space, like relative spectral response of a detector, what the hell does that mean when I look at the picture when I get my final image? That's the kind of stuff that we do for NASA. This is more of a discussion for what are the new generation of instruments? How are we going to merge the data from these constellations of satellites. Increasingly, this is the way the world's going to go. The United States does not have the resources. You guys aren't paying enough taxes to do this on its own. And so we are going to work synergistically with the rest of the world, who's now in space and will stay in space, <coughs> to generate more pixels looking at the Earth. But how do we use them effectively when their sensors are different than ours? Not a lot different, but slightly different, enough so that I can't glue the data together until I make some adjustments. And so the tools that we're developing are, are going to help with that process. I talked a little about this, the ghost and the stray light issue. The data from Landsat 8 were nearly unusable. And when Matt and Aaron's tools go online, hopefully within just a couple of months, we'll be able to use uh, Landsat 8 data. We're doing the trade studies now for some of the things to be done with Landsat 9 and likely 10. Landsat 9, by the way, is going to be a clone of 8 that's scheduled for launch in 2021 at the moment. It was slated for 2023. They've moved the launch date forward. NASA almost never moves the launch date forward, so 2023 is probably still a good date, but they're targeting 2021 at the moment. Landsat 10, on the other hand, uh, is being traded for a totally new technology. What that is is still up in the air, but they're going to be design, significant design changes for Landsat 10. We're trying to help uh, NASA and the U.S. Geologic Survey make those trades. By the way, times have changed. The Landsat mission is now completely a joint mission between NASA and the Geologic Survey. They're working tremendously together, which government organizations almost never do. USGS is putting the definitions of what the instrument should be. NASA's going to build it with their contractor base. So NASA's, NASA works with the instrument to design it, design the details, build it, put it on orbit, they then turn it over to the geologic survey that operates and distributes the data. The specs, the high level specs of what the instrument should be, come from USGS, sort of arbitrary by NASA in terms of, we can't build that, so that's, don't, don't put this, hold us to that spec. So this is where the, the Landsat program is now. 
Uh, signals and noise, I mentioned a little bit how OLI has good, got great signals and noise. RIT led the, the team that demonstrated all the good stuff you can do with lands at eight because of signals and noise. Hopefully you noticed that I talked a lot about water. If you heard any other Landsat talk in the last 40 plus years, you would not hear about water. It's Landsat. My <laughs> colleagues remind me all the time, it's Landsat. Well, there's a good reason for that. The first three instruments, remember I said they had seven bit uh, dynamic range, seven bit uh, digitization. Well, when you have seven bits of digitization, you're trying to take images the whole globe from the equator at noon to the uh, 50, 60 degrees north when the sun is in the southern hemisphere, you only get a few bits of data over water. So water has got, it's quite darker in between. Maybe you get that much information in the early Landsats, and so you couldn't do much to study water, so nobody studied water. They didn't even put a blue band, which is most important for water, on the instrument because they had no intention of looking at water. Landsat 4, 5, 7, I showed you we did things with water. I couldn't tell you the details of how much chlorophyll was in the water, but if I knew that the variation was caused by chlorophyll, not sediments, I could begin to map that stuff. And that's what we took advantage of. We said, let's squeeze out what we can of the Landsat instruments as they come to us for land, but to do water stuff. All along, screaming and yelling, the water was an important part of the planet, and we needed instruments to study fresh and coastal waters. We've built satellites to look at the ocean. That's the easy water. But we haven't built instruments to look at fresh and coastal waters, which frankly is all the water you ever touch and all the water you ever drink. So that's the water you really care about. And so we've been pushing for the, the NASA and the USGS communities to take a more serious look at water. With Landsat 8, we finally did that. We have an instrument that lets us look at water. With Landsat 10, we are pushing hard for there to be even more capabilities for water. So RIT has led the charge uh, along with a few other people over the last almost 30 years to get these satellites to where we can do important work with, uh, with water. We're finding that these new, the new instruments that have been operating for the last few years can be used to study water. So my punchline here, RIT has played a small but we hope significant role in the evolution of the Landsat program. We are working on continuing to work on Landsat calibration, we're continuing to work on the Landsat temperature product, and we're continuing to work with the engineering teams designing the, the next programs. John Carragas is leading the, uh, the RIT work on that now to uh, try and help with design trade studies for the next generation of uh, Landsat instruments. What about the other way? Well, again, this is my myopic perspective. Uh, what's happened for, what's, what's RIT got from this relationship? So 38% of the journal articles I've written over that period have been Landsat related. 12% of the very large number of students I've tortured have uh, worked on Landsat projects. Uh, 20% of the conference papers, and about 28% of the funding for my research has come from NASA, from NASA in particular Landsat. Uh, so Landsat has played a sizable role here. This is just me, by the way, this is in the whole center. But Landsat has played a sizable role in the shaping of the uh, remote sensing program here at RIT. So I'd like to think we've had a, a synergistic relationship over the years. And <laughs> I'd like to think with Emmett leading some of the calibration work going forward and John Kay leading uh, some of the systems engineering work going forward that we've got a, a long and productive future with, uh, with the Landsat program. So I talked very fast so that we could have a little bit of time for questions and I could have talked for four or five days about my intent. It's a very, very special program in terms of Earth observation from space. There are lots of high resolution instruments that don't cover the globe, so you get a really snazzy shot with a meter of resolution. But when you want a picture of Batavia, 
Nobody's taken a picture of a Tavia in the last six years. And so when you need global coverage and you want a picture of where you're, you care about, you need an instrument like Landsat that covers the globe regularly. We have those instruments with lower resolution. Then you can't see your field. If you're a farmer, your field is just obscured with everything around you. So Landsat has this sort of unique niche of imaging the globe with high quality, reasonable regularity, and at a scale where you can see and measure and interact with things that humans care about, like my farm field, my stream. Questions? Who are those guys? When I talked to the first years, we talked about movies today. I hope you all recognize Louis, Rick. Emmett's looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? Before my time. Look at Louie and Rick. Casablanca. Any questions for John? Yes, John. So the early Landsats had a much shorter lifespan and they got longer and longer. Is that because of funding? Is that because the technology lasts longer? Is that because the quality is high enough that it's good for 15 years? Uh, most of the people in the room won't understand what I'm about to say, but you will, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> the sensors on the first three Landsats were photomultiplier tubes. Remember how delicate those were? Mm -hmm. So the short lifetime of the first three Landsats was due to the fact that the technology, the sensor technology, was incredibly crude. Landsats four and five had all shifted to solid state detectors and Landsat 5 is the Guinness record holder for the longest operational satellite lasted over 28 years uh, it was just luck it had a five-year mission life when they launched it was supposed to launch with another payload and the other payload didn't show they had to get Landsat 5 up because Landsat 4 was being shut down for communications reasons so they tossed a giant gas tank in it. So literally, it could last for 28 years because one, it kept working, and two, it had gas. We, you know, five, they set them up for a five-year mission. Usually they can nurse the gas for maybe 10 years. Last I was just chuck full of gas because they needed the, the mass to get the balance right to launch. <laughs> Landsat 7 has been operating now for, I can't remember, 14 years, a lot of years. Landsat 7 is, is using newer and newer technology. What we're finding is the solid state uh, instruments, if they work, they work for a long time. So we're now typically expecting these instruments to last for about seven to eight years and hope they last a lot longer. Congress being Congress, they fund these one at a time. It's absolutely horrible from a scientific standpoint. Uh, but we fought that long hiatus between seven and eight. That was all the scientific community fighting with Congress trying to get the funding released for plants at eight. And they said, well, you know, five's up there working away. What the hell are you guys talking about? These instruments don't last forever. Landsat seven, after about four years on orbit, had a mechanical glitch and it generates radiometrically correct data, but there's gaps in it because of mechanical failure. So they, they're getting better. We hope the push brooms will be very good. There's essentially no moving parts on the push brooms, so we hope that they will have even fewer mechanical issues. On the other hand, they've got 6,000 detectors per band and 11 bands, and so a lot of, a lot of opportunities for detector failure. Any other questions? So I've got one. What do you see as the uh, future for the program in terms of sensors uh, always going to be multi-spectral? Or are we going to be moving in a new era since it's, I think you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, so I mentioned the Hyperion instrument. We, we meaning the, the Earth observing community, particularly the Landsat community, because EO-1 was a Landsat-based experiment. We put a 30 meter GSD spectrometer in space in 2000, 16 years ago. And so when we start to look at what Landsat 
10 is going to be, 9 is going to be a club because of uh, government issues. But 10, we're starting to look at what science should we use for Landsat 10. My expectation is that it will either be a true spectrometer or it will be a spectrometer like the MODIS instrument where it's really a multi-spectral instrument but it has so many bands that it functions sort of like a spectrometer from a data analysis standpoint. So we might see an instrument with uh, 20, 30 spectral bands or we might see a true spectrometer. Yeah. And then to meet the archive, maybe there's additional work to have to follow all those down. Yes, the, the Landsat archive, one of the, one of the things that everybody who works with Landsat now wants is data continuity. We've got data from 1972 to the present that is more or less the same and so you don't want to take a left turn because you want to do time studies. The, the big use of Landsat, the exciting use of Landsat at the moment is time studies so you want to be able to continue your time studies. So whatever we put up, we're going to want to be able to dumb down the data. For instance, if we put a spectrometer up, we'll want to dumb it down so that we can make bands that look like the existing Landsat bands and continue these time studies as well as doing much more exciting stuff. Excellent. Anything else in the back? Yeah. So these, the obsolete, the ones from the 70s, do they just stay in space? Um, the, the answer depends on the era. In the 70s, we didn't give a damn. <laughs> and so they stayed in space until they, they drag. They're, what, they're in a very thin atmosphere, but it's an atmosphere that slows them down, and eventually they tumble out uh, and fall somewhere. Keep your head down. <laughs> uh, mostly, they, most of them burns up. They're not that big a satellite, so small satellites burn up on re-entry. Now the, there's requirements on the satellites since about the late 80s, early 90s, I can't remember, that they have to go through a controlled re-entry. So when we shut them down, so Landsat 5 was shut down, they power it to a lower orbit, so it's out of most of the satellites in the world. Space is really big. But all the satellites are in a really thin belt, so lots of satellites in the same orbit. So you get it out of the way, and then you let it decay from there uh, and burn up. So there, it's a it's a controlled reentry. They put it in an orbit where it's going to likely fall over the oceans, instead of like Skylab, where it spread itself all over Russia, for instance. Uh, luckily, there are not a lot of people in central Russia, so nobody got hurt. But. And, and the big satellites, so Skylab was one of the early uh, precursors of the space station. It was very big, and so it, pieces of it hit the Earth. And so the, the governments of the world have gotten a little bit more concerned for your safety. Excellent. Anything else? One last opportunity. So I do have a little bookkeeping thing. I have to, uh, everybody's looking at me when I say that. Like, what's he going to say? Uh, actually, this is a GR, a Geoscience Remote Sensing Society sponsored, co-sponsored event. And uh, so, you know, I kind of tell <coughs> John if you would say something to, to, uh, to, uh, for us, to us. Um, so just as a quick show of hands, how many IEEE associated folks, uh, members are in the crowd? I just need a two second head count, maybe more than two seconds. Okay, awesome. Let's give John. <laughs> that concludes the seminar. You never really see this. You know what? Uh, I, 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 I,